Welcome to the Purpose Chasers Podcast, a podcast designed to provide insights into personal development, spirituality, recovery, entrepreneurship, with the ultimate goal of empowering you to create an unstoppable mindset so that you can break free from mediocrity and live extraordinarily. If you want to take your personal development further, please feel free to head over to my website, markcrandall.net, and download your free sneak peek of my new book, Embrace Your Past, Win Your Future. Future. I look forward to seeing you in future episodes. But until then, enjoy this one. Welcome back, everyone, to this episode of the Purpose Chasers podcast. I am excited and intrigued for my guest today. I have Clifford Starks on the show, and he is the first individual that I have invited onto the Purpose Chasers podcast that has reached out to me from my website to come on. And mainly because his story is so intriguing. And I'm also a big fan of mixed martial arts. I've trained, as a lot of my listeners know, I've trained in, on my own for about six years. And I just know the mindset and the dedication and the discipline that it takes to get to where Clifford got. And Clifford happened to fight in the UFC and Bellator. Is that correct, Clifford? Yes, that is correct. So welcome to the Purpose Chasers podcast. I am very, very excited to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. So you live in Arizona. Yes. How warm is it there right now? I guess we'll start with an icebreaker. It's actually not too warm yet, but that doesn't mean it's, (laughs) as you know, it's going to get there. Uh, hopefully we get another month before it gets really, really hot, but it's about 91, 92, which isn't bad for what Arizona can do. Yeah. I've, I've spent some time in Arizona. I really, yeah. I really enjoy it. And I, that's, yeah. I mean, that's why I moved to Texas for the warm weather. So Clifford, let's just, for the sake of my listeners and for my curiosity, let's jump into it. What is, can you get, can you get us into how you became a purpose chaser? Man, well, let me tell you, I've been driven since I was a kid, honestly. My my dad, my real dad, was a hard ass. What I mean by real dad is my sperm donor came in or he was in my life and then just left. You know, he was in and out. Uh, wasn't really a good father figure. And then I had a man come into my life who was a father figure and I gave him hell for a little bit. And he he taught me that Love isn't just blood. It's like, you know that saying, blood is thicker than water? Well, he taught me that it comes down to action. Life is about action. And when I was six, he took me to the mirror. He had me look at the mirror and he said, take responsibility for everything that happens in your life. You know, the good, the bad, the indifferent. Uh, Whatever you do, just be ready to deal with the consequences. And so I kind of took that as, yeah, I I have control of my life. No one has control of my life. And I can do and be and feel however I want to. And I opened up that thing. Yeah. Clifford, how old were you when you first had that realization? Like when you first had that internal dialogue? Really six years old. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've, I've had it at a very young age. And it was one of the greatest blessings he could have given to me because it, it has taught me to consistently test myself in everything that I do. And you absolutely have. So did you, I mean, did you have any trials and tribulations throughout your youth? Like I know, I know it's not the norm, but I also know there it's a certain type of individuals is drawn to mixed martial arts. Yeah. Right. There's a certain type of individuals that get drawn to it. And then there's also a unique breed of individuals that make it to the level that you made it to. That's true. Yeah, that's very true. Um, So when I was younger, we lived in Olatuki and they used to call it all white Tuki. I was literally the only black student, (laughs) (laughs) literally the only black student in class. And I'll never forget, there was one time, one of the kids is like, why do you always stand like that? And I go, stand like what? With your butt out like that. So I I went to go ask my mom, mom, why do I always stand like that? She goes, son, you're black. You have a butt. 
And it was one of those things, like, as a kid, you want to fit in. Like, the goal is to fit in. But I couldn't fit in just because of the color of my skin. And so that's when I learned to really take it up and even even more of a notch is people are going to doubt you. You know, that's just the way it goes in life. And sometimes people doubt you earlier than they do later. You know, you get the jocks who have had life go their way for a long time, and then they get older and life doesn't go their way so much. And so everyone's on their own journey. And so my journey, it started with some difficulties that I didn't realize were going to be great for me later on in life. You know, I was not only the black kid, I was the fat kid too. So I had to deal with getting picked on, getting teased, getting told the things that I couldn't do. And I don't, I don't hate on any of those people for doing what they did because they were kids too, you know? They don't, they're only going to do as they know. And the truth is, it does come down to wanting to be like everybody else. Like you want to fit in. The goal is to fit in as much as possible. And my, my weakness, so-called, at that time became one of my biggest strengths because I don't have to try and appease society for the sake of society. I do things the way I want to do them because I've had to learn to do that at a young age. That is. And so when you, I'm just curious, for, this is for my own curiosity. And I know if I'm curious, my listeners are, are curious as well. Okay. At, at, I mean, at some point, did you, had you had enough of the bullying? Did you, I mean, is that when you started fighting or did you find martial arts later? I actually found martial arts later. So I, um, I graduated from kinesiology at ASU and I ended up becoming a personalized trainer. And one thing I've always kind of liked competition. And I, I think my belief on this is so hang on hang on well, let me pause you real quick <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. you Clifford how old were like so you had graduated college yeah and then you found martial arts yes I found martial arts after yeah well after college actually how old were you so I was 28 when I started in MMA how old are you now I am 37 going on 38 my birthday is okay. April 25th Okay, so we're we're at we're at a ten year window right now. How yeah. long have you been out of pro fighting? Um, about a year now. About a year. So yeah, you tr- you trained for nine years. Like this is unheard of. Like I well, yeah, I have I've right. never heard of it. Okay, I just yeah. want to do the math for the listeners. Like this is absolutely unheard of. Either he Clifford is a specimen of of God's army, which he is. <laughs> Or he trained his ass off to get to where he got. Well, what's so, what's so funny about what you talk about, um, wh- when I did get into MMA, I, I came in and I talked with, well, first off, I was training at a place called LA Boxing. Why they call it LA Boxing and it's in Arizona beats the heck out of me, but that's where I was training at. And I realized I wasn't training with a serious camp. Like, it's just no disrespect to them but it wasn't the camp that I needed to train in to get to where I needed to go. And so I started training with the Lolly brothers and that's where Bader came from, originated CB. Kane actually trained with them for a little bit. So I went over to the Lolly brothers and I told Trevor, I was like, I, I want to fight in the UFC in a year. And he, he's a pretty straight shooter. So he sits me down and he goes, no one gets in the UFC in a year. Like it, it can't happen. And I told him, you know what? I respect your opinion, but I have to try. Like just, just train me to try and get there. And sure enough, I ended up getting there in a year. But I got there a little bit too fast because I didn't have all of my skill sets in right, place. So table that because I want to get into that because I had a okay. like I told Clifford I watched. I watched some of his fights after he after he came on, and I was like, "Dude, I lost five bucks." On his <laughs> fight. Like I had, I had you banging him out, and you got tapped, yeah. and it was clear that you didn't have any ground game. But, yeah. So I really want to highlight this, Clifford, because this is just. I mean, this is what I do. This is. I mean, you're talking about stuff that I believe in wholeheartedly. Mm-hmm. So you were training at 
what what sounds to me like and no offense to your old gym but what sounds to me like a kind of a globo boxing gym yeah okay, okay. sounds like a globo boxing gym so you walked into a legit martial arts studio with some reputation of producing some real fighters mm-hmm. you walked up to the one of the owners of the gym one of the lead trainers and said Essentially, after being there for a short period of time, hey, my name's Clifford. I want to be in UFC for a year. And so I just wanna I just wanna kind of paint this picture. So I'm a CrossFitter and I've done, you know, some some training of others in CrossFit. And, you know, when CrossFit was really big and the the it was kind of a fad, right? So like everyone wanted to do CrossFit and everyone was coming in. But you still get trickles of humans that come in that are pretty out of shape or maybe in decent shape and they walk in and they go, I want to go to the games. Yeah. And everyone's like, (laughs) you better quit your life and start training. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm just really, really trying to paint the picture for the audience of the work and dedication that I want to get into and the mental discipline that it took for you to get to the UFC. Cause that is not, I know how you like kind of brushed over it, (laughs) <laughs> but that is not a small feat like that took you had to have worked your absolute ass off what so what i gotta say with that and this is why i do what i do you want to talk about purpose like i said in the beginning i had a man who just left he was out i don't care he never no call no hey i'm gonna do nothing and then another man came in and said take responsibility in your hands, and I'm going to love you unconditionally. This man loves the hell out of me. And so having a father figure that strong, and not only that, he told me to be a better man than he was. And so what I do is to focus on being a better man for him and for my son, because I want my son to take on the challenge to be an even better man than I was. And that's what it comes down to. And that's why I say people are special like every one of us, but there is work involved. Get ready, get ready to get your hands dirty because you're going to have to, you got, you got to have to buck up and you're going to have to deal with your trials and your tribulations, but you're doing it for more than just you. You're doing it for the people that watch you, for the people that listen to you. You're doing it for everybody else. You're doing it for society. That's really what you're doing it for. So even though you have your own special sauce to you as an individual, it is up to you. It is your responsibility to do as much with this body and that mind that you can. That's how I feel about it. And so, yeah, I I do brush it under the rug because it's like, I can do better. I can always do more. That's how special we all are. And it it shows people how special they can be. Dude, I'm glad I took this interview. I really am. I can I, I can just see this this interview running for a while. And and Clifford, I, let's get into it, man. Like, what did after you had that conversation and your coach said no one makes it into the UFC? You strike like you you literally strike me as somebody that's about to become a friend of mine. Yeah, that's because, awesome. Because we're of the same breed, right? We're like, yeah. well, okay, you know. And I'll think about an example. I was just finishing my undergrad program and I really wanted to work in a detention center for youth because it was a a similar center in which I was housed as a youth, right? Mm -hmm. And my colleagues, like the people that I was current, that I was working with at the time, they're all like, Mark, you have multiple felony convictions. There is no way the state's going to hire you. Yeah. Yeah. Watch. Right. So I'm like the same, I'm like the same way. Like people are like, you know, I have felonies or, and I mean, that's an extreme example, but whatever whatever it is, they make excuses when individuals like you and I sit back and go, okay, so I'm going to make this play and then I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to do this. And it means I got to get up at this time and I got to do this before, you know what I mean? So we start strategizing when other people are talking themselves out of it. Yeah, no, that's so true. And let me tell you, it's funny because when you do it enough times, it's almost like they're like, oh, crap, this guy can do it. Oh, crap. Well, he's really saying what he's going to do. But here's what's even funnier. 
And you tell me if you're kind of on the same wave, wavelength with me on this. I strive to make the impossible possible. I like doing that. I like it when they tell me I can't do it. That feeds me. I like it when they're like, wow, he said he was going to do it. And I like it. I, I just, I take everything in and it's a form of positivity to me. The negativity, the positive, whatever it is, everything's a form of positivity. Because I say the opportunities are in the obstacles. And so my newest obstacle was, I don't, I kind of, kind of mentioned it to you uh, on, online, but the uh, guy that I took on was a meth addict for 16 years. And this was after my fighting. So why, right after my fighting career, it was just like, what do I do now? Like, I need something to drive for. I need something to strive for because that's just fun to do. And when I, <laughs> it was so random, he calls me up, he's methed out of his mind. And he's like, I, I need help. I barely knew the guy. We trained a couple of times in the gym for jujitsu. And he's like, I need help. I'm, I'm on meth. I didn't know who to talk to. It, I don't know why I'm even reaching out to you right now, but it just feels like you're the guy who can help me. And I took on the challenge, you know? That, he's almost five months. Five months over? Yeah. That's awesome. Don't, yeah. You keep you keep tiptoeing around this. And I, you, we keep we keep skirting away from it. Clifford, I, bring me through. We'll get into that. I want to get into your coaching and everything. Okay, that you, okay. Because your like your story is so powerful. I want you to share with my listeners the mindset, the determination. Who was surrounding you? What did your work ethic look like? Like, how did you go from walking in a gym to the UFC? It's- it's funny because after it was probably a month of training where Trevor was really, really impressed by how far I was coming along because I, I did not know how to fight. Like when you have a wrestling background, wrestling and fighting are two very different things. They say having a wrestling background is the most important background to have, but I don't think it's the most important background because of the technique. I just think wrestlers are very disciplined. They are insanely disciplined because they have to be. You don't get the option to be soft in that sport. And so all the running, all of the conditioning, all of the weightlifting, all of the training, all of the doing that and then taking classes. See, that's where, that's where my discipline really started was ASU. It wasn't even with fighting. I got into ASU. I remember the first time I got my ass kicked, kicked, thrown around like a rag doll. And in my head, all I said was, all right, I can either give up or I can keep pushing and I know I'm going to get better. I don't know when, but I know I'm going to get there. And after three months of getting my ass kicked, it just kind of came together for me. That's at ASU. Fighting actually came faster. Fighting, I don't think you need to be as disciplined, honestly, as wrestling. Because these are wrestlers who have been doing it. Now, that's going to change eventually as MMA progresses. But wrestlers, wrestlers wrestle when they're like four years old, five years old. They're really good at their craft. And so when you take it to a D1 level, that's, that is professional. That's the professional level. And your mind is going to play these tricks on you like, okay, what are you going to do? And that's like every time your mind like, well, do you get scared? Do you get nervous? Do you get... Yeah, I get all those things. Yeah, I'm a human being, but I know I can push through it and I know I can get better. So I always have the confidence to know if I just don't stop, I'll get there when I need to get there. And to, to me, a year is a long time. Uh, if you're doing it right, that's the thing. If you're doing it right, just like you said, with your, when you're dealing with CrossFitters, imagine how much you can do if you put in true work for a year. And I'm true work. See, people like tiptoe, like, oh, yeah, oh, I'm trying. Oh, I don't know why I'm not losing weight. Well, put the Skittles down. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, a year is a long effing time. Think about if it takes a woman 10 months, 10 months to create a life, how long is a year really when you really put it into perspective, when you're really putting in the work, when you're really going day in and day out? So, yeah, I was going day in, day out because I said, I want to make it in a year. That's the goal. And so I put in work like I was going to make it in a year. 
Now, were you working at the time or were you just training? I was training as well. So I was a personal trainer and I was uh, fighting. So that combination was not the easiest part. No. How many hours? Like how many, how many sessions were you doing? I was training. So I did group training and I was group training for five hours. So you were doing group personal training for five hours or you were doing what? How, what did you five hours? And then for MMA training for MMA training, I would probably train close to three or four hours a day. Every day. Yeah. And you made it into this. All right. So, so now you've, you've done the training. How'd you get your first fight? How did that come about? Um, my first fight was actually at LA boxing. And then my second fight, I uh, was with the Lolly Brothers. It was an organization called Rage in the Cage. So I fought in that stage, and I I got my leg hamburgered bad. Like, this guy was like a high-level Muay Thai fighter, and he's just kick. I didn't even know how to check a kick at the time. So he's just hammering my leg, hammering my leg. So I ended up winning the fight, like, just on guts alone. And... The first thing I was like is I want to learn how to defend kicks. <laughs> like I'm like I need to learn. How to, <laughs> I need to learn how to defend these kicks because this isn't cool. So I went with uh, my coach Jamerson, and uh, I had him work with me for like a good two weeks on nonstop, just focusing on the kicks, focusing on the kicks. And my kick defense became amazing after that. I'm one of the hardest guys to kick now. <laughs> that's that's awesome. So you you won your fight at Rage in the Cage, which I'm I'm familiar with. Mm-hmm. And then what? When when did you get the call? Or so I ended up I ended up going through like a an eight fight win streak, and I uh, Dustin Jacoby was supposed to fight Brandon Tavares, and Tavares ended up getting hurt. So they called me in and said, "Hey, we got a fight for you," but it was a week from the fight that I had just had. So I had just fought in shark fights, but I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take this opportunity because it's the opportunity that I've been waiting for. So yeah, I fought twice in literally basically a week and a half. That is awesome. So you've talked to me a little bit uh, about it before the show, but what was, what was your experience in the UFC? It was a heck of an experience. It's when you're walking down that ramp and you see the crowd and the noise and it's it's almost like you have the fight but you have the pre-fight you have to be in the camera you have to do like put on makeup you have to have rehearsal there's so many little things that you have to that go in to getting ready for the actual fight so that does take discipline too like it's you have to stay on top of it you can't say, oh, I can't make my weight because of this, this, and this. No, you have no choice. So it's, it's your job, you know? So you treat it like a job and you respect it like a job. And when I got out there and I, I ended up fighting on, that, on the big stage, it was a great experience. You know, I absolutely appreciate every moment that I was given. And the truth is, I actually did get there a little bit too fast because the, you don't know what you don't know. So I didn't know how weak my ground game was until I got in there. And that's why I'm like, okay, well, I got to, I have to readjust. Let's talk about that. Cause I remember uh, I, I started trolling your fights and I was like, oh my gosh, I yeah. remember this fight. And there's you like the size difference between you and Ed was just, I was like, he's going to eat him like a, like a Slim Jim. Yeah, <laughs> and then he and then he did this. He did like a weak judo toss. Yeah, and there goes Clifford, and I'm like, no, defend, defend, <laughs> lose five boxes. Yeah, yeah. What were you thinking at that point? You just like, I mean, I I know what you're thinking because you're just like me. So it's constantly like, okay, here's another here's another weakness. Time to yeah. learn it. Yeah, I just I really started tidying up my jujitsu game. Because jiu jitsu is very different than wrestling. Like they're very, they're very different and very similar, but you can't figure the similarities out until you understand what those little intricate differences are. And so I started tightening that game up. And it was, it's just more of the same, you know, just like it takes three months of getting your ass kicked and then you get good. 
like three months of really going in and and learning the techniques and putting it together and going with guys that you shouldn't be going with because you know they're so much better than you. But iron sharpens iron, and you just end up figuring it out, figuring it out, and you get better. The only issue I I did have was in the UFC they say it's easier to get in than it is to get back in because I fought my ass off. And I was, I became a very high level fighter, but it's just harder to get back in because they're always looking for that new blood. So when you, so you stepped out about a year ago, Mm -hmm. so your reign was what, how many years? So about a little over eight years. A little over eight years. How many fights did you have in eight years between Bellator and the UFC? I ended up having about 22 fights. 22 fights. And, yeah. and it was, it, was it your decision to get out of it? It was because I, I had my son and I had to make a decision. And it, it wasn't the easiest decision to make because I still feel like I'm in my prime. But I was just like, you know, I want to be able to spend time with my son. And I want to want to honestly just be the best dad that I can be for him. And the kind of training that you have to do at that level you just don't have time for anybody you just you don't you have when you when it's time to go and you're training for a fight for three months or six months that's what you're focused on that's what you're dedicating your energy towards and how many hours are we talking like what what was what did your training regimen look like um Honestly, I do like two a day training. So I train in the morning and then I train in the evening and then I condition in the evening. So I train like two hours in the morning, two hours in the evening, and then an hour of conditioning. So about five hours a day. And there'd be, oh my God, there were times when you, when you put your body through that kind of pain, you'll literally have nightmares. Like, when you go to bed at night, just because it's, it's like, Oh my God, like you, your body doesn't want to do that. Like the push that you have to have, your body does not want to go through pain. It wants to go away from pain, but in order to get that hand raised, you have to go into the pain. What a great analogy you just made. And I want to, I want to tie this into, to give something tangible to the, to my audience. And so many of us, avoid taking actions that we want to take. So like an example is Clifford walking in his gym and saying, Hey, I'm going to the UFC in a year and his coach going, (laughs) that doesn't happen. And then him, and then, you know, him getting the call a year later. Right. But so many people would never even voice that out of just the fear of the disappointment. So we as humans avoid stating things that we want to do. We avoid f- t- stepping into our absolute potential because we want to avoid the mental pain or the embarrassment or whatever it is. You, yeah. you find that to be true? I do. I do. And I, I think um, what people need to do a little bit more is just say F it and do what they want to do and do what they want to say. Because here's the thing, if you tell someone, if you tell people like twice in your life that you're going to do something, right, and you don't end up doing it, and they're laughing at you, so you remember those two times, you will remember that forever. But if you tell people thousands and thousands of times all the things that you're going to do, they're actually going to remember the positive ones. That's what people miss sometimes. It's like, it's not that you have the failures. It's just that you keep moving and you keep going and you keep improving yourself because we think too linearly sometimes. We, we freak out about there's exponential growth on the other side, though. There's always the exponential growth on the other side. You just, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to attempt this. I'm going to try this. I'm going to do this. Let me try this. Ah, uh-huh, you fell. Ah, uh-huh, you fell. Oh, crap. They're figuring it out because that's part of. Figuring it out. You have to fail at it. If you're, if you're not failing at stuff, that means you're not trying stuff that's even worth attempting anyway. So go do things that you fail at and then get better at it because you give people a beacon of hope to not only try it, but to say it. Say what yeah, you're going to do. Have conviction. 
It's um, a couple things come up for me when you say that. So number one is something that I say on almost every episode, and it's actually in the outro of my podcast, and that is failure is a word reserved by those that quit. There's no such thing as failure outside of quitting. There's, there's attempts, right? So there's Absolutely. attempts and lesson learned, and then, and then you quit. But yeah, so many people are scared to say things. And I tell, I tell almost every client that I have, the only way to build self-esteem is to do esteemable acts. The only way to gain confidence in yourself is to disprove what your mind is telling you you can do. 100%. Yeah. I want to share an example. So January, I wrote my list of wish list podcast guests. And at the top was one of my favorite thought leaders and influencers. He lives here in Austin. He was at the top, but it kept coming to me that I couldn't ask him on. Mm -hmm. He needed to ask me to come on, which in my head, I was like, that's never going to happen. I did a Facebook live this last Friday about my new book. He commented on it and invited me onto his show. Wow. That's awesome. It's awesome. And I just want to share to those of you that are, that are listening to this, like you got to walk through your mind to take the actions to get to where you want to go. Because Clifford didn't walk in this gym, say, I want to go to the UFC in a year and then just start binge watching UFC on TV. (laughs) He got punched in the face multiple times. He got his leg tore up. (laughs) You know, he got injured. He just kept going. So it takes, it takes putting it out into the world, which you, know, you can do through visual or your words, and then it takes the mindset to follow through because it's not just going to happen for you. you know, yeah. there's, a, there's like in, this, in the thought leader space, and I know you're aware of this, there's a lot of f- like foo-foo fluffery out there, right? It's like, oh, I want to be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. I get that. Now, now that you've put it out in the world, like what actions are you going to take to make that happen? Because a million dollars isn't going to like a stork's not going to drop a million dollars. (laughs) And you're going to be like, Oh, now I'm a millionaire. So it takes, it takes action. So Clifford, what an amazing journey that you've been on. And I can't, we were talking, I mean, we were talking about sales funnels before Mm -hmm. this podcast. And, uh, I mean, I got. I'm probably going to give him my feedback at the end of this, but I have a million ideas for how you could absolutely blow yourself up online. But we won't. We won't get in there now. I'll share that with you once I stop record. But what are you up to now? What do you? I know. I mean, I know you're doing mindset coaching. I know you're working with individuals that are in recovery around their mindset and their addiction. And I know yeah. you're doing a lot of speaking. So yeah. what does that look like? What are you up to? So, yeah, I'm just reaching out to companies, speaking at their events and their engagements. And like I said, the challenge, you always want to continue challenging yourself. You want to continue to grow. And so this one client that I took on, I'm actually, I actually did an interview with him just so he could share his story to inspire other people. But he was, he was addicted to meth for about 16 years. And he was, he was just done. You know, he, he wanted help. He had been getting coached by a lot of people. And like I said, eventually people start saying like, you're the guy who can do anything that you put your mind to. So I became that guy, but no one wanted me to take that challenge on. Like people were telling me, Cliff, don't take this challenge on. Like meth is, that's the devil drug. It's one of those ones that people just can't get away from. And so that honestly piqued my interest. That made me want to take on the challenge even more and try even more. And I, I've always, like, I'm really interested in, in the psychology and how people, like, how the mind really, really works and really functions. And so I took him on and I kind of gave him my no BS training. It was a combination of no BS training, but at the same time, having that unconditional love, because I think that's important. I think it's important to know that the person that's working with you actually cares about you. And when I put those two together, like he, he just mad, the magic started happening. The magic started happening because 
Mark, the truth of the matter is people just have to get good and honest with themselves. And like you said, like, I want to be a millionaire. Well, ask them the questions. What are they willing to do? What are, what willing, what work are they willing to put in? Because a millionaire work is a lot of work. Like it's not going to just, it's not going to fall in your lap. You know, what are you doing? Are you reading up on what you want to do? Are you taking action in what you want to do? Do you have a coach for what you want to do? What are you doing? Are you taking this seriously? Because the more seriously you take it, the more opportunity you have of getting there. They say if knowledge was enough, everyone would be six or would have six packs and be millionaires. But it's not enough. Knowledge by itself is not enough. It's the effort that you put in with the knowledge. Because honestly, you don't know shit. Like when you really think about it, you don't know it until you do it. I could have read every fighting book on the planet. It wouldn't have mattered until I got punched in the face. It wouldn't have mattered. Like, it's just like, all right, I know how to ride a bike. I've read like 800 books on how to ride a bike. No, you don't. And so my favorite, my favorite quote in the world, it, and yeah. I have the poster up in my garage by my Muay Thai bag. It's uh-huh. Mike, T- Mike Tyson. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah, every time. Every time, like, oh, I know what to do. Oh, crap. No, I don't. Like, just like, <laughs> go learn. Go grow. Go figure uh-huh. it out. And so even when I, when I took him on right, as a client, I, I pushed him to a different limit. Like, that's all it is. All people need is to just to be, I'm going to push you to a level you're not used to. And so what growing is, is constantly reaching out to people who will push you to a new limit. That's it, one way or another. And like even me reaching out with you, Mark, you know about sales funnels in a way I don't know about. And so, but I can learn it. I can learn it. I know that, but it's going to feel uncomfortable at first because it's different and it's new. But that's okay, because I know if I keep acting on it and I keep taking it serious and I put in real effort, I'll get there and I'll figure it out. And that's all it is. Like, that's all life is. Anything can be figured out. Anything can be figured out. I told him, stop hanging out with certain people like this. Stop hanging out with these type of people because you will lose every single time. Start hanging around people who are going to believe in you. Start hanging around people who are going to lift you up. Go to your... uh, Go to your AA. Go to the things that you need to do. Take the action that you need to take. And then all of a sudden, oh, magically, your life starts coming together. Isn't that something? Well, isn't that something? So you've hit on something a few times that I want to dive in a little bit because it's, I would say, 80% of the the intro coaching calls that I get on of individuals that want to work with me. And even, I, I mean, you know, I'm a therapist. I also do substance abuse interventions and do family work as well. 80, I would say at least 80% of the clients that I get on a phone with have hesitation around investing in themselves. Mm. Right. And so I know that it has nothing to do with me and everything to do with what they believe they're capable of producing based off of what they're going to spend. Right. Yeah. But I just want to kind of draw an analogy here when you were training. All right. So I have hopes and dreams, right. And I have, I have two coaches that I'm working with. I actually have a call with one of them today and he's probably going to kick my teeth in because that's why I hired him. Right. But you think I'm just curious and for my listeners to get a perspective, what was the amount spent per year for you to continue to train? How much did you invest in yourself to get to the pros? You know, that's actually a funny question. So I, I spent uh, three months training or paying Trevor Lilly, right? So it was three months paying him. And then just the basic essentials of like gear and stuff around that. So I'd say roughly around probably a couple grand, couple grand. But you know what's even crazier though, Mark? Like um, people don't realize like you're going to pay a price one way or another, you know, like, and I know you know that you're going to pay a price, whether that be financially or whether that be in time or whether that be in energy, whatever it is, you're going to pay a price. And the thing is, it doesn't even have to necessarily be financially. Like a lot of my stuff started working for me financially just because I had the work ethic that they wanted to be around me. So they're like, yeah, you don't have to pay. (laughs) Like, yes, you know, and that's like, people will start doing for you 
but you have to do for them. It's like if you take a step, they'll take a step. If you take three steps, they'll take three steps. But yeah, you we could do. I mean, we could do the math on that, right? So you're either going to pay financially or through time, because I've Absolutely. I've made more barter deals since I've been in business than I, you know, than I can shake a stick at. But mm-hmm. there's a, there's always a swap, and the kind of what I wanted to draw on is if you if you have a dream that you want to fulfill on. So I'll share like you know, writing my second book Mm -hmm. and getting it and getting it published and doing everything that I've done. I have 300 copies of it that are going to be arriving today, you know, for an event that I'm speaking at, but like a price had to be paid. Yeah. I paid an editor. Yeah. I've paid some money. You know what I mean? All that stuff. And yeah, I I grind to get the word out there. Yeah. A price has to be paid. Like it doesn't just happen. And I've had so many people recently ask me, oh, how did you get there? And they think that it's like, you know, they think that like, and I'll just share like one of my mentors, you know, they think that I just, I, I, I met Hal Elrod and all of a sudden, you know, now he's like, oh, come into my world to be a part of this. No, yeah, yeah. because he's watching me. Mm-hmm. And I'm not thinking about him watching me. I'm thinking about the lives that I need to impact just like yeah. you are. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, what gets people in their trouble is we are, we're very linear thinkers. So even, even me looking at me today, that's what people see is like the finished product. So it must've been, oh, you must've always been that way. Like, no, it wasn't always this way. Like, no, that's not true. And I want people to get out of their own way. Like one of the coolest things about now is now people really get to hear the stories. So I really believe we're going to have more success stories than we've ever had just because they do get to hear about the grind. They do get to hear about the hard times. They do get to hear about all those little things that helped create you. They helped create you. All of those pastimes, all of those, all the energy that you put in, everything that you've done in your life is helped you become who you are today. That's the beauty of even being a man, being a man isn't well, I blow out, I blew out my 18th candle. So now I'm a man. Like it's all those little things that you put into it. That's what it comes down to. And we live in a time where there, I mean, there shouldn't be any, any kinds of excuses. Like we just live in a time that anything is possible. Absolutely. I mean, you're the number one business consultant that anyone has is Google. Like you yeah. can, I'm a YouTube video away from being a plumber. That's not to say that the pipes won't leak when I get done, but like yeah. I could, you know, it's just, we live in, we live in such an amazing time and there's really, there's really a, a great uprising of individuals that are, that are seeking to support, encourage and challenge, you know, our population to go above and beyond. And there's a lot of individuals stepping away from the societal norm of what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. and and encouraging individuals to follow their greatness and so in this episode what i want to really share with with the audience is what i you know what i always talk about chase your dreams like if you have something in this life like i know and i don't even have to get into it because i have a heart connection with clifford like i know he's like a brother from another mother or you know from another father of a mister you know (laughs) i was gonna say sister from another mister but that doesn't fit but (laughs) You know, it's like when I said I want to write my first book, I I had been saying that for like 10 years. The the esteem build, the how much belief I had in myself after I finished the first book, I can't explain that to you. It's just like Clifford can't explain to you when he said, I want to go to the UFC, worked his ass off to get a shot, walk, I got goosebumps right now as I'm sharing this walked down the aisle to go in the ring, I made it. Yeah. Right? Like I made it. Absolutely. Yeah. But then there's a certain type of individual like myself and Clifford who immediately go, what's next? Oh yeah. <laughs> like no, immediately. Absolutely. <laughs> like that that just what you said, that's the high of life. Like you go, because the happiness is in here. It's intrinsic. It's in you. But the excitement that's the touching the success. But after you touch it, you have to go touch another one. Like you don't just go, well, I've done it. I'm done. Let me go sit down somewhere. No, you're never done. You're never done. 
No, and I have I have some friends in my circle that are like, oh, I'm going to work, I'm going to work, and I'm going to work, and I'm going to get passive income, passive income, and then I'm going to retire. <laughs> I'm like, I am. I can't see myself stopping. I just yeah. love what I do so much. Ooh. But for where can my audience learn more about what you're up to? So I have my website at cliffordstarks.com. You can also check me out on YouTube, Clifford. Uh, just Google Clifford Starks, and you'll find me. And then you can also email me at info at cliffordstarks.com. You, man, I am, I have like, and I was telling you before this, um, I have, I have a few intros that I'm going to make for you to get on, to get on some more podcasts. Your story is absolutely incredible. And, and it has inspired me, man. Like, Thanks, Mark. you know, to, and I was telling you, I had a, you know, Scott Kujak, a, a buddy of mine here in Austin who had been training boxing for six months and won golden gloves. It's like kind of, it's one of those things, right? It's like easy to say, yeah, I trained for a year and made it to the UFC. Like what? Yeah. Yeah. And for those of you (laughs) listening, like that is not the norm. Yeah. Like most people train from like the, into the time they were knee high to a grasshopper in an, in a, in an attempt to get to the UFC. So yeah. it's, it's more about mindset than it is anything else. And if, you know, if I can leave you listeners with anything at all tangible to take home is that it is about mindset. Your mind dictates your life outcomes. What you believe is who you become. Clifford, man, it has been an absolute honor having you on. I look forward to getting to know you. Thank you, Mark. It was great. Yeah, I love being on. And just what you said. It's all about mindset every single time, 100%. Okay, let's see if you tie this in. So I, I ask all of my guests on my show, what is one message that they would leave with the world? There's greatness in you. You might not know it, and you might know it, and you might be taking the action, but there's greatness in you. Remember that and repeat it. But greatness is not about being cocky. Greatness is about being humble. Remember where you come from. Remember who you are. Do great things for yourself so you can do great things for others. Mm, Mic drop. I can't drop my mic because it's on a stand, but that's a mic drop moment right there. Clifford, man, thank you so much for coming on. I look forward to continuing to follow you. And I, who knows, maybe we'll have you on again. Thank you so much, brother. brother. I appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Purpose Chasers podcast. I want to encourage you to head over to my website, markcrandall.net, and download your free sneak peek of Embrace Your Past, Win Your Future. Also, if you receive benefit from this episode, please feel free to go to iTunes, throw me a five-star rating, and leave me a review. I appreciate you and look forward to seeing you on future episodes. Get out there and live life because your dreams should never be on hold.